So, uh, everyone, I'd like to welcome Karine Nimba uh, from Brussels to talk about the history of the Rwandan genocide, movie Hotel Rwanda, and the current situation with the abduction of Paul Rusesa Bagina by the regime of Paul Kagame. Uh, Thank, you. Thank you for welcoming me on the show. Thanks for doing this. Thanks a lot. So, I'd like to ask uh, some questions. You were one year old when the genocide happened. You escaped to a refugee camp with your sister, Naïs. How did that happen? So I, so as you said, no, I was one year old. Both I was with both my biological parents at the time. They were still still living. Um, Thomas and Fidens Kanimba, right? That's correct. Yes. Um, they were both unfortunately killed during the war. Um, and then through a friend of, of a family was able to, to bring us from the home where we were to the refugee camp, um, which is where we reunited with, um, with uh, Paulo Recessa Begina and Tatiana, who raised us then as their own children. Good. So early in the genocide, you managed to escape the camp. So... Uh, when exactly? What day? To escape the camp? The camp from... Uh, oh, to the escape to the camp. Oh, I do not know exactly the details, unfortunately. Oh, that's all right. Uh, secondly, I wanted to ask you about something in the movie. If you ever spoke to your father or someone about this, and if you can verify it, it's one of the darker scenes in the movie when Paul goes to Paul Rutaganda to buy some supplies he asks him, you don't really intend to kill all the Tutsi. He responds with, why not? We're already halfway there. Is that true? Did that happen? Um, so the conversations in, so, so my father wrote a book called An Ordinary Man, which he details uh, kind of everything that happened um, during the genocide and his role um, during the war, as well as all the interactions that he had with, um, with the inter as well as the, 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 the refugees at the, at the Milkolin. Part of a lot of what you see in the movie, their interactions themselves are also, um, it's a, a Hollywood version of the reality. So then you also have um, dialogues that were created by the, the producers and the, and the actors, but most of it, but in terms of the reality of how um, the plan to, to get rid of the Tutsis was, was there, um, but they were not the only victims, unfortunately. And um, and that's sort of what we've learned gradually, more so over the, the past 15 years and more. Um, however, yes, the genocide, the plan during the genocide was for them to get rid of, of the Tutsis living in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. That's true. For historical context, in uh, April of 1994, there was a genocide in Rwanda against the Tutsi, Pa, and moderate Hutu groups. And as uh, referenced earlier there were also reprisal killings by the RPF Hutsi, um, Tutsi led rebel group by Paul Kagame led by Paul Kagame um, which again it muddies the waters uh, it, it makes a worse situation even worse worsens the cycle of revenge that I think culminated in in the genocide but since then a lot of people have said that Paul Kagame has bought stability and because he managed to stop the genocide, he's managed to live off that credibility. What's your opinion of that? So essentially, those are um, it's it's very a complex situation. So you have the genocide in Rwanda that occurred where they were getting rid of all the Tutsis. The goal was to exterminate the Tutsis, like my parents and others who lost millions, who lost um, uh, their family members. Um, however, Paul Kagame's role in the genocide, um, and he uses the guilt and uses genocide as a tool to not only continue to guilt into the international community into the fact because of the fact that there was little action coming from the international community, but also uses it as a tool of um, to repress the Rwandan people, both from Rwanda and abroad. So when Paul Kagame arrived in Rwanda, um, he calls it the Liberation Day, or he calls it when they were going to liberate Rwanda from, from the, the chaos that was at play. However, um, that's not necessarily accurate. He um, was actually not only is accused of having been the one who took down the plane that was that the pre previous president was on, which initiated the, the genocide, but he also... Yes. 
that he's also um, uh, being accused of having killed many people, sending people in people in trucks to go and, and hundreds and hundreds of people in trucks and killing them just because they were Hutu. So um, he's known as the person who ended the genocide, but he actually committed a lot of it too. Um, and he participated in committing genocide. Um, but in addition to this, when we talk about stability, you just said a lot of people perhaps don't say anything about Rwanda because it's, it's stable. But exactly. what people need to understand is that um, it's, it's a repressive regime. Just like when you hear you go to North Korea and people are clapping from Kim Jong-un, it's not, it's about the same situation in, in Rwanda in the sense that the stability that you sense when you're in Rwanda or when people speak to Rwandan people, it's not a stability that anybody wants. This is a repression. The people are afraid to speak. Journalists are killed. Human rights activists are killed or kicked out. People like my father, who we'll, we'll talk to in a second, um, are being arrested and imprisoned and silenced. So it's a repressive, dictatorial, authoritative regime. It's not stable. Um, that's true. And why does it have to be that chaos takes hold before the international community does something. Why not do something while there is an opportunity to do something? Does the events of 94 have to happen for you to do something. That's the problem with the regime of Paul Kagame. And we see this Western foreign policy with places like Iraq and Libya and North Korea, where it doesn't matter that there's a government there that violates the most basic of fundamental human rights because they're not disturbing the international order. They're supplying us with what they need to supply us. And the criticism begins when it's too late. Exactly. Too late. And then, and just to add on to your point is that, for example, when we talk about um, during the genocide and the lack of intervention during the Rwandan genocide coming from the international forces or international community, um, that is also because partly because of Paul Kagame and his RPF army that went to send their own army to Washington, New York, um, to the United Nations in New York. And there are many, plenty of reports about that those meetings where they specifically told the United Nations and the military to not intervene militarily. And that was on April 30th of 1994. So about it, almost 20 days, more than 20 days into yeah. the genocide that lasted 100 days. And the reason they told them not to intervene is because Paul Kagame and his RPF army wanted to take power in Rwanda. And so when he guilt the international community into not having intervened, the fact that he's also partially responsible for the lack of intervention is, I think, very troubling. But to go back to the moment, um, the need for, for action, when there needs to be action, um, is important because people have already left Rwanda behind in 1994. This has happened, we know that it's true. And regardless of the, the way Kagame uses that to guilt people, it's true. However, now Rwandans are still in need of intervention. They're being killed and, and imprisoned and disappearing, and yet people are closing their eyes. So it's a continuation of, an act of inaction. It's true that any, many supporters of Paul Kagame will, uh, will leverage that against you he stopped genocide, but a good act does not wash out the bad, unfortunately. Each act must be judged on its own merits. And in order for justice to be true, I think it has to apply both ways. To both the inter way committed the genocide, but also people who could be proven to have shot on Habir Mana's plane, whoever they may be. And of course, also committed reprisal killings against Hutus. Justice has to go all the way around, or nothing built on lies will last, I'm afraid. Absolutely. And um, another important point, unfortunately, when people do bring up these charges about Paul Kagame's um, crimes in, during the Rwandan genocide, as well as, um, as the, the crimes that continued, since the genocide, so for instance, today, when people um, uh, comment on the human rights abuses in Rwanda, he often calls those people, including myself, which is very strange because, uh, and I'll say this in a second, but he calls us genocide deniers, genocide ideologists, gen genocide negationists, which is all absurd. It's, it's just, it makes absolutely no sense because first of all, when I'm being accused of being a genocide denier, when- You I lived it. 
Yeah, I lived it. I lost both my biological parents during the genocide. My adoptive parents made a movie about the genocide. And so those are allegations meant to silence people and then imprison them. And also to continue to guilt the international community by making kind of playing with the words genocide and denial. And uh, frankly, I think it's a disrespect for the Holocaust and the, ho the victims of the Holocaust by constantly throwing the, those words around when they're not um, true to the people that they're being um, talked about. Hmm. I think definitely Paul Kagame is trying to tie Paul Rusesa Bagina to Hutu extremists and the Interahamwe to try and slander him with that name of genocide denier or supporter or he, and any title like that because he thinks that if Paul Rusesa Bagina is discredited as such, be, his movement for democracy will be less pat palatable to the Rwandan people. Absolutely. He wants to go by association. Kind of. And it's and it's also important to kind of get the context of, of who um, Paul Rusesa Begina, my father, is in order yes. to, to understand it. Um, but um, so during the genocide, um, my father was the, the manager of the Hotel de Milkeline, for, if you, for those who haven't seen the movie. Um, mm. And he sheltered um, and he really just at was it happened just because he was in that situation and realized that he had a hotel with rooms and a space for people. Um, he let them all in, anyone, Hutus, Tutsis, Swas, whoever needed shelter. Um, and then he used his ability to speak and to get himself thought of situation to protect those people for, for almost 75 days until everybody was safely evacuated to refugee camps and nobody was killed. Um, and so that was an act of hero heroism that he received millions and multiple awards, sorry, not millions, multiple awards for his action and for his role during the genocide. Um, by George Bush. He was awarded and by George Bush. Yeah. Absolutely. Most notably, the, he received the highest civilian award in the United States, which is the medal, the Presidential Freedom. Medal of Freedom. Yeah, yeah. Yes, in 2005. And that actually is a perfect segue into what happened next. So per, coming from the dictatorship, the Rwandan dictatorship um, of Paul Kagame, mm -hmm. is that at first when Paul Kagame saw the movie, he was happy that a person, a Rwandan, was sharing the story of the genocide, educating people about it, but also shedding light on, on things that, that needed to be learned, on lessons that needed to be learned um, in order to move forward. And with that, he started offering my father positions in his government, ambassadorship, minister, anything really. He offered everything that he wanted, but my father is very principled, not only principled based on human rights principles, but also um, on his values. He felt he knew that, um, on, based on, on justice, sorry, he knows that Paul Kagame is responsible of those crimes we mentioned earlier. And so he said, first off, if we need to have a real truth and reconciliation process among Tutsis and Hutus in Rwanda, we need to set the record straight. We need to talk about all the crimes. We need to be able to acknowledge all the people that were killed. Um, because up until this day, when you talk about Hutus being killed during the genocide, you're called a genocide denier, <laughs> or you're bejeled or silenced or anything. Justice so has to be universal. That's absolutely, true. absolutely. You need to be able to, to, to bring the truth on the table and bring people on the table and talk about, the, about it in order to move forward together. And that's what my father wanted. So when he rejected those offers for, for positions in the Rwandan government and then started talking about all that, the things that needed to happen for Rwandans to reconcile, um, Paul Kagame saw him as a, as a direct threat. And not only that, but also once he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, um, that's at that moment that Paul Kagame started um, a, a smear campaign against my father. He Did you see him as a threat to his power? Probably. Exactly, exactly. Not only to his power, but also to exposing his crimes and the tension towards or surrounding something that had been concealed and that had been successfully um, uh, pushed aside by claims of a lack of intervention, by claims of genocidal denial deny or negationism. And so um, my father continued as continued to advocate not only for that truth and reconciliation process, but he also continued to expose the crimes, the current day crimes of Paul Kagame. Um, and that did, he did not, but Kagame did not like. And so my father as one of the most known Rwandans um, had the platform and the international um, attention that is needed in order for justice to truly happen. And so he started this smear campaign against him, releasing hundreds of articles, trying to discredit the movie, discredit the hotel, uh, the military and what happened and call my father a liar, a genocide denier, even a inter I think at some point my father was called a genocidaire. And so um, they've 
this is a way that the that the government has in silencing people, silencing critics, and then essentially and unfortunately to the point of kidnapping them, like what just happened to my father recently. I think it would be the equivalent of the modern day German government mistreating someone to save Jews during the Holocaust. Exactly. So, I think that's a fair analogy. Just so for the audience to understand, Paul Rusesabagina and Tatiana Rusesabagina, mixed Hutu and Tutsi couple, saved 1,200 people in the Hotel de Milcolin from the militias who were committing the genocide. And Paul Rusesabagina negotiated with the militias for two hours, two hours, and got them to spare people in the hotel. He did excellent work. He saved lives, and now he's campaigning for truth and justice democracy in Rwanda, and he's been imprisoned and abducted illegally. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. Uh, two hours, I think, he negotiated for 70 days in trying to keep them safe, but uh, yes, yeah. essentially, yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask about the um, relationship between Paul Rusesabagina and Agustin Bizimungu, uh, the general mm -hmm. who committed the genocide who was responsible for committing a lot of it. Um, did your father ever talk to you about this man? Did your father ever give you um, an idea of what he was like? Because in the memoirs that I read, read somewhere, I'm not sure, I'll, I'll post a link. Um, he said he had a drink with him in order to negotiate safety of the hostages. And did he ever talk to you about Bidimungu? Yes, I think he's he's mentioned it to him um, a few times, and he's also I, it's a, he talks about it quite a bit in his book, and you see him in the movie as well. Um, unfortunately, I besides the, the the negotiation that we all know had to take place in order for him to be able to save the people, and he had to do that not only with General Bizimungu, but also every single time somebody attacked the hotel, want to to try to enter, he had to go back and make phone calls everywhere in the world, whether it was France, the United States, the White House, the, the UK, everywhere he could um, for somebody to call and uh, to, to, to bring help or to intervene before they could be killed. So this was um, something that he had to do constantly and continuously and in a stressful manner. I think he, he's often talked about not even having the time to be afraid because he, there was so much to do. Um, and so that's that's kind of that's exactly the man that he is. And that once you have to to do, you have to to act and and do all you the best that you can to keep people alive and safe. Yeah, I think how many people would have done what he did? How many people in Rwanda when they gave them the gun and said kill these cockroaches? How many people did it? So Paul, I, Paul Sesobagin was one of the heroes who didn't do it. And exactly. That's that's unique. Exactly. But then it's also important to remember that other there were other Hutus who also saved um, sheltered people. And that's why so many of us are still alive, is that because we were protected also by the Hutus who did not want to join into the killings. The ones that did the killings are the extremists. And so um, when, and this is kind of also fits into, it's important because um, the narrative that Paul Kagame wants to, to spread, and he constantly wants to call it the genocide against the Tutsis and no one else, is to try to continue to to build that um that hate and that uh, animosity between both groups and to say these are the others these are the bad ones when it wasn't across all the board of all hutus that did the killing that is not yeah. accurate and the so, prime minister was a moderate hutu agate habiarimana agate willingimana i believe right she was, um, she was yeah. the prime minister murdered on the 7th of oh, April. Right, she was right. Yes, exactly. And so so it's um that blanket labeling of of uh, the Hutus as being the killers is wrong and it's mm -hmm. it's um it's misleading and this is kind of what allows Paul Kagame to continue to, 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 to oppress people by saying, by the way, and so for example, my father who is a Hutu himself, if he wasn't Hutu, they would not have been able to call him a genocide denier, an ideologist or a negationist or a genocidaire. Um, they would have accused him of some other crimes just for speaking up, but, um, but that's a way that they continue to constantly silence any opposition, any person, any person that 
dares to criticize Kagame is that is being put under that label. Um, and it's not fair because not everyone is guilty of, of having done that. And the ones that were have been put in jail and are being are being watched and and um, and monitored. So it's a blanket judgment that is not fair to the Rwandan people. Mm. That's true. I wanted to ask you about for independence in Rwanda. You, you're a Rwandan, so I, th I think you can correct me if I'm wrong here. The division between Tutsi and Hutu, does it even exist or was it invented by the Belgians? Because I know he dated them somehow, but they exploited it. I'm not familiar mm -hmm. with the history there. So um, Hutus and Tutsis existed already, and Twas. Yeah. They all existed um, historically in Rwanda, and then they had been living in kind of normal way in the sense that they had each one had their, their roles and their communities, and whether they were intermixed or not, I think that came with history and with time. Um, but it was just an order of society in terms of the way things work, but there was not as much animosity. The presence of the Belgian colonists in 1918, I believe, is when they arrived, and then essentially, the, with the, as we know, the, the old Belgian uh, colonies were all very brutal and violent, and and um, and so they added what they did is that they they forced they added the ethnicity into the um, identification cards. So yeah. everyone that was walking around it said whether you were a Tutsi or a Hutu. That's and what the Interahamwe roadblocks used to identify people during the genocide, yeah? Exactly. And so, but on top of that, they also gave the power to the Tutsi um, ethnicity. So they educated the, the Tutsis because the, uh, the king, the way it was led is that back in, in, in the days of when it was a kingdom still, the Tutsis had the, 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 were the, the kings of the kingdom. And then the, the, the uh, and so anyways, there was a setup in order in the way that it worked. But um, by doing so, they educated, they gave, um, provided more training and, 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 um, and through colonization um, gave a lot of resources and, and education to the, the Tutsi community, which then was repressive of the Hutu community. Um, back when the Belgians were in power, the Hutus were mistreated. Um, and then eventually, I think after the, the revolution and after independence, when the Belgians left and the Hutus also took power, um, they took, they kicked out all of the Tutsis that had repressed them for this time. And then the, the the switch happened and then the Hutus were now repressing the, the Tutsis and okay. among some of the people that had to be um, to, to exile, to run into exile from Rwanda was Paul Kagame and his family in 1959. And mm -hmm. so he left Rwanda and grew up in, the, in Uganda as a, Rwanda, as a refugee in really bad conditions in the refugee camps until 1994, where, when, uh, 1990 actually, when the war started in Rwanda and began to, to bring his army back into Rwanda. So the power at play has always been between Tutsis and Hutus in power, at least for the past century, has been um, both and uh, one takes the power, then the other is repressed. The one takes the power and the other is repressed. And then now we're exactly in the same situation, although much worse, I think, based on the way Kagame runs his, his government, in that we're back with the, the elite Tutsi repressing the, the, the majority Hutu. And That's um, the problem, is you can't speak out against that without being accused of wanting to repeat the events of 94. Exactly. It's, you can advocate for liberal system with representation without wanting to repeat these events. You can condemn these events and avoid repeating the cycle of history. Also, admitting that corrections need to be made. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, I wanted to ask you about Umuganda, the monthly ritual of uh, cleaning every last Saturday, cleaning the town. Uh, all Rwandans do. Yeah, I don't know much about it. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed in Rwanda. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Uh, but tell me, go ahead, perhaps I have a... <laughs> I was going to ask you, is that somehow used by Paul Kagame to legitimize his government? Because I, I, I read the articles of him joining in the Umuganda, cleaning up the community, saying that it is a symbol that we're past all the hatred of the problems of the genocide. But, is I it think, just a populist kind of way? 
I think first of the idea of cleaning up the streets, he knows that um, it fits into uh, what is needed for this world and climate change. What we desperately need is that there has to be some change in the way that people behave and how they get rid of their trash and so on to, to protect our, our, our planet and, and, um, and continue to, to for the longevity of the, of the earth. Um, however, um, a lot of, and it, it, I, I understand the idea, however, part of what the forcing of people to, to do so, I think is also shows how repressive the regime is that when you don't show up for the cleaning, then you get punished or you get um, some types of really strong sanction that any pre-world would say this is not appropriate. Um, but I think the, just the idea of um, wherever they got that idea from, I think the one part is the initiative is right because of our planet and climate change and the need to protect it. Um, mm -hmm. However, the forcing of people to do it and the implications when you don't um, shows you that they have no choice and that think, they have to follow. I think that's a, I'm sorry, I think that's a problem with the Western media because they don't mention the fact that it's forced. They only praise it and say, you know, it's good that the community is brought together the last Saturday of every month, but they don't say there's serious sanction if you're a conscientious objector for whatever reason. Absolutely, absolutely. So, and that's exactly, that fits into every, and I think the problem with the international community, the media, the human rights organizations is that every time they bring um, something up, Kagame brings back the genocide guilt again. He says, if you're violating human rights uh, today in Rwanda, well, then where were you in 1994 when we needed you? If that's what Kagame says, then where were you? Um, you should not get messed up and get mixed up in our problems now. You should have come before. And so then those people immediately feel like, oh, you're right, we didn't intervene. Um, so we should not say anything and let you run your country in the way you, you want, but not realizing by, by stopping right there is allowing Kagame to continue to repress his people and hurt them and um and uh and is continuous the dictatorship and the, his authoritative regime and that's true wrongs do not make a right and i think failure to intervene in 94 should be a motivator to interfere now rather than the opposite failure to intervene in 94 should make western countries guilty about intervening now if you think you have a mistake to make up for make up for it mm -hmm. that's what it seems like uh, like to me Right. And, and I think part of, um, of what's happening with my father today, and, uh, and perhaps we'll, we'll get into the details of that in, in a bit, but um, that concept of intervention as well is, I think, very um, in interesting, given that during the genocide in 1994, um, he was calling for help everywhere in the world, saying, please pay attention to us. Please come and save our people. We will all die if you don't help us. Um, right now, my father has been calling attention to that, to the, just, to the injustice and the killings going on in Rwanda on a daily basis just for speaking, just for saying an opinion, just for stating a fact. And, um, and so today my father finds himself in a situation where he's being silenced um, in Rwanda after the kidnapping in Dubai. And so, um, and so the need for intervention and the need for, to speak up is now. Mm, not sure. It was yesterday actually, but now. I think that's a good segue if you can take it from here about specific details of what happened to your father, your last communication with him, just get away. Yeah, so um, in uh, at the end of August, um, this 2020, August of 2020, specifically on the 27th of August, I, uh, my father was traveling to Dubai. I actually helped him reserve his flight from San Antonio, Texas to, to Dubai. Um, and he was supposed to return on the 1st or 2nd of September. Um, he wasn't supposed to, to be there for long, but um, on the 31st of August, I woke up in the morning and read, looked at the TV and saw that my father was in handcuffs at the RIB, the Rwandan Investigation Bureau. Um, in Kigali, Rwanda, I was shocked because um, the Rwandan regime has gone after my father for so many years. They've broken into our home here in Belgium. They've That's why you had to move to the USA, correct? Yes, for our safety, because we did not feel safe here in Belgium. Um, he, there was assassination attempts. They broke in and stole documents. They go to every single one of his events and disturb it and call him all those words I said earlier, as well as, as like genocide deniers and so on, and then call him a liar and then the terrorist and all those accusations that are completely unfounded um, just to discredit him, to smear him, to silence him so that he doesn't continue to speak up. Um, and so I, I know that because of that, my 
father would have never gone to Rwanda willingly. And, um, and so it was very strange for me to wake up and see him in the, in the, in the news. Um, but most importantly, um, I knew that he wasn't going to Rwanda. This was not his destination. What happened is he got on the plane thinking he was going to Burundi from Dubai, and then the plane landed in Kigali. When he was, while he was on the plane, the authorities tied the, the Rwandan who kidnapped him, uh, the Rwandans who kidnapped him, tied him up um, and put him and, uh, and for three days and for that remained for, for three days. Um, he was tied up by the hands and by the legs and he was blindfolded without food, without water, without medication. Um, and he was essentially tortured for those three days until being paraded in front of the media and uh, the Rwandan Investigation Bureau on the 31st of August. Um, so that's his arrival in Rwanda was through torture and kidnapping. Um, and then the Rwandan government changed their version of how he arrived in Rwanda at three different occasions. At first, when they put out in the news that they had caught him, um, they um, said that it was through international cooperation, that there was an arrest warrant and that the international people, uh, agencies cooper cooperated with his arrest. Um, that is not true. Uh, Dubai, the Dubai authorities said they had nothing to do with this. The Belgian authorities said they had nothing to do with this arrest. The Americans said they had nothing to do with this arrest. And really no international co-op agencies uh, uh, said that they cooperated. And so the next day, um, we kept saying that this was kidnapping. And then at the end of, of, uh, of that second week of his kidnapping, the president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, who had, had multiple instances in the past, called my father names on, on public um, platforms, um, went on, the, gave a press conference and said, well, we lured him to Rwanda. Do you have a problem with that? What if we tell you that he came on his own? Will you stop finding a problem with him? That was all through his speech. Um, and his press conference. And so the next day, coincidentally, the official story of Rwanda was that he was um, that he was arrested in Rwanda, that he came to Rwanda and then they arrested him there. But the but he came was, willingly. That he came willingly by his own free will to Rwanda, which is not true. My father knew that the government of Rwanda yes. wanted to kill him. They've tried, they've attempted multiple times, they've never succeeded, but he wouldn't have willingly gone to Rwanda. Just so that, for the audience, in 1996, Bolshe Sabagina was given refugee status in Belgium right? yes. because of the threats from the Kagame regime. And then from Belgium, they had to move to the USA again because of the threats of the Kagame regime. So the idea that this would be, you know, that he would willingly go back to Rwanda when he's wanted by the regime is, it doesn't make sense. Absolutely. And so then another story that the Rwandans are saying, because in order to extradite, um, so first off, Belgium doesn't extradite its nationals. When you have a, a problem with the Belgian, you, you, the person will be prosecuted here by independent judges, and it's um and it's the way that that it works. The U.S. has um, sent extradited multiple people in Rwanda who were a, a cr accused of, of of terrible crimes to Rwanda. So there is a procedure in the process to arrest someone who is in another country. But the Rwandan government decided to bypass all this and um, by and by by kidnapping him um, really just and then claiming that he arrived on his own and then changing their version of the story multiple times um, is, um, is, is, is it clearly shows the lack of, of legitimacy not only in the allegations that they're bringing forward but also in, in their own justice and their own justice system and how it operates given that they violated international law to bring him to Rwanda. Um, and another factor, like you said, that became a Belgian. It became a, it came in Belgium as a refugee in 1996, and in 99 he became a Belgian citizen. Mm. Back at the time, um, Belgium did not allow dual citizenship. Neither, neither did Rwanda. So as soon as he became, uh, first of all, when he became a, a refugee, he gave up his Rwandan citizenship, um, and then he also, and then he also formally gave it up again in 99 when he accepted Belgian citizenship, given that neither accepted you to have dual citizenship. And so he's now only a Belgian citizen and he's also a permanent resident of the United States. And so the Rwandan government continues saying that if a Rwandan, um, uh, any Rwandan can be prosecuted and tried um, without having to go through the systems that are in place in order to, to be, um, to be the pro prosecuted. And that's also all wrong. They have to go through, first of all, you can't kidnap someone. A fair trial doesn't start by kidnapping and torture. 
there. Um, but also there are methods in place to get somebody in front of a judge if you do have legitimate crimes. And so that's will perhaps lead into, <laughs> into the, the, the allegations and so the his treatments in Rwanda thus far. Yeah, it's true that uh, he, he was given, he was put on this kind of Soviet kind of confession that he was made to do. Uh, exactly. Yeah, it's unacceptable the way he was treated and uh, and the way he's still being treated today, frankly. So he, yeah. um, during those first days that he arrived, they um, we found we created we um, we reached out to team of, uh, an international team of lawyer. We hired a, three American lawyers, one Canadian, uh, one Australian, one Belgian, and one Rwandan. The one in Rwanda had been going to the prison since the day, the really first day he arrived in Rwanda. Um, he continued, we had him the, on the 2nd of September, sorry, that's when he joined the team. And so he continued to go to the Rwandan Investigation Bureau saying, I'm here to represent Mr. Paul Rusesabagina. But the Rwandan government continued to, 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 to uh, forbid him from accessing my father. And it denied said, him legal representation. Exactly, in the, in the beginning. But like the important part, I think, is that not only did they refuse for our lawyer in Rwanda to see him, but they also imposed their own lawyers onto him. Um, so they chose lawyers for him that were that worked for Paul Kagame, lawyers that were part that worked for the same person that kidnapped him to supposedly represent him. Mm -hmm. And so those two lawyers were fake lawyers, frankly. They were there for the show to appear as if there would be any type of, of, of a, a fair trial. And and, um, and on top of that, they kept him in community, those lawyers as well kept him in communicado from us, from his family for multiple days before we really had to make noise in the international media, with the international, with politicians for the, us to be able to hear his voice because the pictures that we would see every week or so were pictures of my father's health degrading. And so we know that he was being tortured and we know he was being mistreated um, wherever he was. And, um, and so, in addition to this, the, eventually, after a lot of work and a lot of pressure, international pressure, um, we were able, the Rwandan government first continued saying that he had chosen those two fake lawyers for himself, but then um, we knew that it wasn't the case. And so after a lot of pressure, we were able to get them removed from the case and the Rwandan government um, said publicly that they were going to take their lawyers back, which is in some ways an admission that they had imposed them and that my father did not choose them as they claimed at an earlier part. Um, and then now they said that um, he was allowed to have only access to his Rwandan lawyers. The other international lawyers who all have practiced in Rwanda in the past, they all are experts in human rights. They have, I think one of them even trained Rwandan lawyers and the Bar Association in Rwanda for many years. So they know the law, they know the rules, and they are eligible to work there, but they've all of a sudden changed the rule for my father, the rules for my father, in order to keep him from accessing defense for himself and truly being able to defend those fake allegations. Because at the end of the day, these allegations aren't legal in nature, they're politically motivated. Exactly. That's, that's what it comes down to. Because Paul Kagame fears for his regime and his power, mm -hmm. he doesn't want let political opponents speak up. Exactly. That's and, what it comes down. And then thus far, and it goes even for worse further because so for instance, we are working with the Belgian authorities that are providing consular assistance to him in prison, but that consular assistant is honestly not really doing anything because we sent them medication um, through the diplomatic suitcase and they were very kind to bring it to the prison. But as soon as he got to the prison, the Rwandans threw it away. And now they're giving him one pill, some type of medication that we don't know what it is. He doesn't know what it is. He's telling us that he feels sick and ill all the time and those are the conditions he has hypertension he has like heart conditions and he has he survived cancer so he has this uh, medications to follow and to mean to keep him okay and now when we speak with him he's describing all of the symptoms of a person who's not being treated right for his hypertension and so we think that they are either poisoning him with with that medication that he's being forced to take um or they are it's a placebo medication to make him feel like he's being treated but he's not in and healthy at, at all he's not doing well on the on the from the from a physical health perspective um, is it possible i'm sorry please continue 
sorry, Lazar is just gonna conclude with in addition to the, 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 the torture that he, he experienced when he was tied up in the first few days, the lack of access to his lawyers um, and the imposition of fake government lawyers meant to just not work in his best interest, but to represent the represent interest of the, of the Rwandan government um, and his medication, his health, he's lost almost 20 pounds now since he's arrived in, in Rwanda. And so, um, and so we can tell he's being mistreated and, and, um, and everything thus far indicates that he will not have a fair trial in addition to the fact that the charges are are completely made up what i was going to ask is is it possible to discern the goal of paul kagami here what does he want does he want to imprison your father does he want to kill him does he want to silence him what what's the so, goal where does this end so my th thoughts and i think part of what our, our family and our team thinks is that first off he wants to silence him he wants to make sure that he loses credibility as a person because my father spoke about peace and justice and human rights all his life i mean all his adult life he this is what he stood for um and reconciliation and so that gave him a platform and he received many awards that gave him an international platform to tell the story of rwanda and the injustice going on and the crimes being committed by the Rwandan government today. And so by discrediting, by, by labeling him a terrorist, by labeling, by making up these crimes and making it go through his justice system very quickly in order to, to lock up my father, it it's allows him to silence my father and not be, and for him not to be listened to and be, be credible in the way that he has been all this time. Um, so there is the silencing aspect, but there is and the smearing aspect. So he really, since Hotel Rwanda and my father's refusal to join the Kagame administration administration, he's gone after his person, his, uh, my father's role as an individual, calling him names, calling him really awful things, because honestly, my father did absolutely nothing wrong. He was a good man who saved people's lives and continued to advocate for justice and democracy his entire life. And that so, should be evident the good treatment he received by the Kagame government after the genocide. They only turned on him after he refused to join. Exactly. And so, after, after he received those awards and then realized that the, the, the platform was, was to, was, uh, the, that he wasn't going along with the narrative that the government wanted. And the narrative is that only Tutsis were killed in the genocide and that nobody else needs to be mourned, which is not fair for people who lost their family members um, in the genocide that each year during the commemoration, um, everybody gets to, to cry and mourn their, their loved ones that, that, that were killed. But those, the Hutus who lost their dead one their, their their family members cannot join those commemoration wholeheartedly because they're not able to even speak the names of their dead family members um so that's a truth that needs to be uh, again uh, set the records that need to be set straight and um and uh, my father continued to speak up about these things and now kagami wants to silence him and so everything he's done thus far in the trial in in my father's presence in rwanda is to try to to silence him to speak Near him to accuse him of awful crimes and lock him up forever, and um, and so that's why that's exactly what we're trying to to to, to fight and and um, we really need the support of everyone, the international community, to to call out this wrong, to call out the kidnapping, to call out the the rights to defense legally. Everything that has happened is wrong. is It's a violation of international laws, of Rwandan laws. Even state that everything that's happened to my father thus far is not correct, and so. Um, and so that's why that international pressure, that international um, pressure on Tokigami to, to release my father but, and to actually respect political space for, for the freedom of political space for anyone to be part, to join the politics and not just Kagame and his narrative and his regime and his RPF party. There is a, a legitimate legal method for intervention, presumably not only because Mr. Saspagina is a Belgian citizen, but I believe also Rwanda is a signatory to the International Covenant on uh, Civil and Political Rights, which guarantees a fair trial, mm -hmm. which Mr. Saspagina has not given a fair trial. Right, nor access to, to his chosen uh, defense, his chosen lawyers, there he's not been given that access and mm -hmm. yeah. So you, you alluded previously to these specific charges. I read about uh, Terrorism charges and association with Kalikste Nsabimana in what I believe to be an, an armed revolutionary group. So, could you please clarify what the charges are and why they're completely false? So, there are a list of 13 charges, including um, 
sorry, including child soldiers, recruiting child soldiers, recruiting military people. I mean, it's a lot of and terrorism, murders, like it's a lot of a lot of made up allegations. Everything is fake because um, first off, my father was a member of the MRCD, which is a coalition of political parties that, so there's millions of Rwandans in the diaspora because of the repressive regime. A lot of us have to, to be exiled, to run away um, from Rwanda for our safety. And so all these parties not only want to, to go back to Rwanda, but they want to, to, to enjoy their country and they want to be represented and they, they want their human rights to be respected, which is the least anybody can ask for. Um, and so they created a coalition because they realized that there were so many groups of, of, um, of, uh, of, of people and parties that were outside of Rwanda trying to, 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 to be able to join the political space in Rwanda. They created a, a coalition of multiple groups um, in order to, to, to have a larger platform and bring, bring their, their minds and thoughts together. Within that group, there is a group called the FLN, which is the armed group of the CNRD, which is another one of the parties that is part of the coalition. So that, the CNRD is the, I believe, Rwandan Movement for Democracy? Something like that. I believe so, yeah. And then FLN is Forces for National Liberation? Right. Which yes. is the armed wing of the democratic movement, if I'm not mistaken? That's correct. That's yes. correct. And so they are technically, no one controls, so at least the MRCD and the, the coalition of the MRCD does not control the FLN. The CNRD does and the generals of the FLN control themselves. Mm -hmm. um, first off, we have uh, reasons to believe that the attacks that my father is being accused of in 2018 were actually led by the Rwandan government on, on false flag operations. In order um, to smear your father in order to smear my father. And they do this, and it's not the first, they do this quite often in Rwanda. If you read the book by Bad News, um, by uh, 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 Anjan Sanjaram, he details a, a couple of those of those um, instances, and I can send you the, the title of the book. Um, but um, so essentially there are, claims that we have plenty of evidence that show that those crimes were actually committed by the Rwandan government, which has done these types of flag for fl uh, false flag operations in multiple instances in order to smear my father. But on top of that, um, the FLN themselves and the MRCD and every member of that party knew that their own goal, they knew that they were not responsible for their attacks when they happened in immediately in 2018 and the government wanted to blame it on them. They came out publicly and said, this is not us. Um, and then they and and eventually they continued to 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 make it clear that their organization was to, for, for self defense. Every time the Rwandan government charged at them, they defended themselves. They had never had any intentions to attack civilians, nor did they ever attack civilians or, or hurt or kill people. This was the only self defense organizations people of people trying to not only have access to a political platform and democracy, but also who have been living um, in the forest of of the Congo for many, many years and have been uh, ripped of all their rights as humans. Um, Self-defense from the Kagame regime. Exactly. Because, because they cannot coexist peacefully. The exactly. FLN, I think, I think in their platform, they are willing to stop this, the existence of this armed wing if they are guaranteed certain political rights. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yes. And, um, and, uh, and so that's essentially it is that the fact that all because that FLN was part of that coalition of parties, the government and my father and then the, the coalition has a rotating president every six months or so, because my, my father was part of that MRCD coalition, they're linking all of the made up crimes of the FLN because like I said, the crimes were actually done by Paul Kagame's uh, uh, false flag operations. They um, are trying to say that my father is not only responsible for creating the groups for for funding the groups for terror for killing civilians for murders it's all completely made up and to go even further the fln itself was not was created a couple years before the mrcd even existed and so any allegations that my father and that was the fln was its own group that joined the mrcd coalition so any allegations that my founder my father founded the fln is wrong it's a, it's a complete lie there is plenty of evidence that shows that the FLN already existed before they joined the MRCD coalition. And um, Paul Rousseff, again, is committed to nonviolence. Absolutely. He stated in many interviews. 
many and that's right that's another reason why it's so strange to to hear them co consistently try to to throw the word terrorism at him because he his rhetoric for over 20 years has been peace and and viol non violence and dialogue and reconciliation and and so the fact that they all of a sudden they're like look the real man is this terrorist but it's not it's, true it's absurd the kagame regime is playing us for fools i mean your father had the chance be a terrorist and he said no 94 exactly. and, and the regime is accusing him of being a terrorist now exactly. they're taking us for fools they're, they're maltreating human beings who have done insurmountable good and so much good absolutely and yeah please continue yeah about and, the charges um, and the sad the sad thing too is that my father is not the only one in this situation oh so let me uh sorry i'll get back to this in a second about to continue about the charges so first off the charges are all made up it's based on the false flag operation led by the rwandan government that is now to trying to pin it on my father and and the mrcd coalition um and then on top of that um the 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 current oh i kind of lost my chain of thoughts <laughs> so, um, but um, yeah, so essentially the, the MRCD and the, 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 the existence of the MRCD was not a, a meant to terrorize Rwanda, to stabilize Rwanda whatsoever. It was about to bring political change in Rwanda through the democratic, democratic means. Um, yeah. Can I present to you an opposition argument? And because I tried to give the benefit of the doubt to any, any, any of my political opponents, I, I try and put myself in their shoes, just, just out of instinct, out of principle, just anyone I debate with. And so when talking about the Kagame regime, again, people so violent, you don't want to be in their shoes, but if you absolutely have to see the way things they see them, just to get a glimpse of their worldview, the way I see it is if you're a Kagame supporter, you're arguing, yes, Kagame may have done things, but if he leaves, what takes his place? Are we going to go back to 94? Is there going to be ethnic violence? Is there going to be instability? Are there going to be rebellions? This is, this is the, the best possible argument I could find. I'm not convinced by it, to be honest, but this is, the, the, this is what I could find. Is so I if, would I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the best I could find was if the Kagame government is resigns or is overthrown, will um, lead to instability, the repeat of 94. What's your comment to that? So first, I would say that um, this is precisely because it was it's, it's sorry. First, I would say that the fact that President Kagame remains in power is what actually might lead to another atrocity because he's not letting the space for anybody else. Anybody that raises uh, concerns about him, he kills them, they disappear, they, they are imprisoned. And so this is creating a culture of fear where when you're in Rwanda, if you and I were sitting at a cafe in Rwanda right now, this cannot have this conversation would not be yeah. permitted. We would both disappear immediately or be killed or be imprisoned. And so the lack of, of the ability to have a, a true conversation about the state of the affairs, the state of politics, the current conditions of the Rwandan people um, means that these people, the Rwandan people are being repressed, their voices are being shut and they're, they have no rights to, to, as individual to speak and to speak freely and, to, and to, to share their thoughts and be part of the, the political space, which is highly needed in order to have a true successful democracy. Um, and then on top of that, so your argument about if Kagame leaves, there might be just lack of stability. First off, he's had over 20 years to create, to have a, um, a, a to create a, a method of transfer of power. So this is, if anything were to happen today, and because of if he was to leave, it would be his responsibility that he wasn't, um, he didn't put in place a system that can lead to a transfer, a peaceful transfer of power because of the way he repressed his people and killed anyone who ever dared to oppose or speak up against them. Following um, the genocide, he did centralize power in his hands and persecute his political opponents, which is why you and your family had to flee to Belgium. Exactly, exactly. And so and so not only was it his responsibility to to then create a system if he truly is what he wanted for the, the, the best interest in the future of the country was to create that system and have a, a way to transfer the power and, and democracy, a regular election where he doesn't win by 99%. 
Um, but on top of that, um, I think honestly, people underestimate Rwandan, the Rwandan people. I think people, we've because of how repressed we Rwandan people have been, they're also very, very intelligent. The reason they're being repressed is because they know that if they speak up, their lives would die. They're, they might lose their lives. So this is a question of, of a matter of, of life or death. If life was an option, then you'll see so many really intelligent and brave Rwandans who will be part of the political space. But again, this is a question of life or death and people are choosing life, which means they're not speaking up because they know that if they do, it's death. But Rwandans are very, very intelligent. They're very aware of what conditions they're in. And they have to, they cannot say anything because of the conditions that I mentioned. And so the thing is just by giving them the space to be part of the politics, to open up, to have more than one party, because the RPF party is the only one available. And I'm sure you might have seen recently in the BBC report where even in the diaspora, they're making Rwandans forced to take an oath of allegiance to the RPF party. Um, um, the, that continues, that just forces people to, to be part of that one system. And if you should go away from that system, then you lose your, 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 your life <laughs> or you're in prison. And um, as soon as the space opens up for others to be part of that, that political system, then I'm sure things will be fine because nobody wants violence in Rwanda. 94 was shocking enough, um, was traumatizing enough for multiple generations, then nobody wants that violence. And I think I it's part of the repression that why people will, are afraid to speak. I agree that the underestimation of the Rwandan people is there. The taking away of agency from the Rwandan people to assume that to slide back into chaos if uh, Kagame is removed from power. You have no evidence of that. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm aware, uh, Rwanda has every chance at success once it's free from the authoritarian regime of uh, Kagame. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a horrible situation down there. And as you mentioned previously, the elections, elections in Rwanda are basically Cuban elections. 99% <laughs> for the past few elections, I believe, for uh, Paul Kagame. It's, yeah, Rwandans it's, cannot speak up at all. Absolutely. absolutely. There is no, I mean, the, any country that claims to have a democracy and the president wins by 99%, you know this was written into the ballot or written, written yeah. the results were, were, were chosen by somebody. Here in Scotland, uh, it's considered a super majority when 62% of the people voted to remain the European <laughs> Union. So right. you imagine what a super majority 99% is. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And uh, I remember my thoughts I wanted to bring up earlier about the charges is that um, yeah. we found out just recently that my father will be, um, they want to bring the 17 other rebels that they found um, to be charged alongside my father. So they should, they want to, to, to try to trial 17, 18, people, uh, 17 or 18 people together, um, including Sankara, like you said, and the 17 others. And um, and the fact is, first of all, my father has never met any of those people. We, he lives, he's grown, he lives in the US and Europe, and this is where he, he's been. Um, but also we know through the human, human rights, sorry, through human rights watch reports and various other reports that um, people, Kagame tortures individuals in prison and forces them to confess and con uh, confess crimes in order to either get some rice in the prison more rice than usually or to be able to be even take let out of prison if they comply and so not only there's that that moment of that that the idea those people are being trained and tortured to 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 speak against my father and to claim false things against my father um and the fact too that we know that those people will not be able to 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 truly, uh, we hope at least that they're not going to be able to lie in the way that that they want, that the government wants them to. Although I'm sure with torture and being mistreated, people will prefer to do what they want rather than what's what's asked of them, rather than continue to endure the torture. But I think what's important to look out for if so, the trial date has been set for the 26th of January. Um, it's very strange. So seven, 18 people, only a 250 indictment um, uh, uh, pages and uh, 250 pages of the indictment for seven people who are being accused of terrorism and um, and other charges. First of all, that sounds like a very small 
file for chasing people. So, so that goes to show that they scribbled those things and made it put whatever they could. This is not a well thought out indictment. Um, and on top of that, they want to speed it up really quickly. On January 26 is a very soon date to try to try 17, 18 people that were just um, arrested. And so this tells us that what to look out for if there is a, a, a trial in, on the 26th of, of, um, of January is to look out for the fact that these people will, these 17 people have been trained and tortured and are going to show up to accuse one another and accuse my father of crimes. Um, and then on top of that, that the, the, the crimes that, that the, the indictment and the, the charges that are, bring, are being brought forth um, are not well uh, made up even. <laughs> I think if you look at the indictment itself, it looks like a third grader, a lawyer third grader wrote the indictment. And so it's a lot of ridiculous things and it shows, it brings, it, it adds more um, the lack of legitimacy in what they're doing. And, um, and I think it's very important to know this going into this because this is how the Rwandan government operates. Essentially on the, on the January 26th, I think it's very important for those who watch the trial look for signs of physical torture because that does go on and we will be probably looking at a soviet show trial yes That's unfortunately what we're gonna see and i fear for the fate of mr sasabagina uh, shouldn't be treated that way it's again denied medical treatment denied contact with family now put on this show trial <laughs> Mm -hmm. And no access to his international lawyers still cannot even meet with him. So where do you see this being solved? How? Where does... <sighs> That's the we need thing. to talk about solutions, I think. That's the, the solutions comes from the international pressure. So I would ask all of the listeners to, um, to call your local representatives and ask them to support and to, to, to call, to tell, to ask for one that's released my father based on all the grounds that the, the laws that were violated, based on his health that's deteriorating and the lack of fairness and that, that will, and has happened and will continue to happen. Um, so I would encourage you to call the, uh, your members of parliament and ask them to do something about it because yeah. we know that international pressure works. Paul Kagame loves entertainment attention. He loves being seen as next to the Clintons and the Blairs and so on. And so by going to those people and saying you are shaking hands with, with a criminal, with a person that has blood on his hands, then that can lead to the pressure that we need to, to get the people, to get him to react because he's realizing that he's, this will not help his popularity. This will only make it worse. Um, and so give, this will be the way to, to help my father, but continue to make noise, hashtag prove recess begina. It helps in raising awareness and bringing more attention to his cause, um, as well as like um, donating to our legal defense fund. I mean, the, as you can imagine, all of these, um, these uh, the the lawyers and the the traveling before the lawyers to Rwanda and the and the, um, the the communication all of it is very expensive and obviously we have the Rwandan government attacking us and every single thing that I say or anybody in my family says they threw through all of the resources of the state at us and we're doing our best to keep it together and to not only mentally and emotionally to stay strong because my father needs us to be but even financially we need to continue to to work with Really hard to raise funds and to be able to afford this defense that will take bring my father home. Mm. I wanted to also shift this from what we can individually do to a bit of a policy brief exercise. Uh, a year ago in uni, I used to do a policy brief exercise where you pretend you're advising a senior governmental figure about government policy. So if we assume that someone in the government somewhere is listening to this, which hope uh, what's your advice what's an actual policy economic pressure diplomatic pressure expelling ambassadors what are we talking exactly i mean in terms of policy here so in terms of policy i think economic sanctions work economic sanctions on rwanda is something that will lead paul Kagame to realize that this is more serious than just um it's it's serious it's something that is that needs to be um addressed and he responds to that type of pressure um and frankly what i know for instance in the past when belgium 
called out the Rwandan um, uh, human rights abuses. Paul Kagame kicked out the Belgians out of Rwanda. Um, I think he, he kicked out the couple Belgian consulars. He and he stopped Brussels airline from landing in Kigali for a bit. And so um, this is the types of methods that he uses to to discredit or to silence people who are speaking up against these abuses. So then. Let's do it. Let's do it to him. Let's see. Let's end that relationship. Kick out the Rwandan ambassador since we know that they are being, um, that they are acting. They're puppets for the regime. Exactly. They're, exactly. They're, they're trying to smear his enemies and carry out his tasks in foreign countries under the shield of the diplomatic passport. That's yeah. unacceptable. Yeah. Unacceptable. Yeah. Uh, I also wanted to ask about uh, this idea of back in the genocide of Paul Kagame would have stopped earlier than he did. He didn't. You alluded to it earlier, but I was hoping to get into it specifically. He chose to consolidate what he took in the rest of the country, centralized power. Mm -hmm. and he petitioned the United Nations and the Western powers not to interfere when genocide was occurring against his own ethnic group. He turned a blind eye to it, essentially just to gain power. He, is it fair to say that he facilitated hundreds of thousands of deaths because he wanted to take power? Is it a fair accusation? Absolutely. Not only facilitated, but also committed deaths. He yeah. killed the people. Like during the genocide, like you said, so on April 30th of 1994, um, he sent a couple of his of his um, uh, generals, RPF army um, members to the United Nations in New York um, and had them and told them to ask the United Nations not to send military intervention. And he claimed that all Tutsis had already been killed. This is only about 20, a little over 20 days into a genocide that lasted a hundred days, which means that after those 20 days, once on the April 30th, after when when Paul Kagame asked the Rwandan the, the international community not to intervene, intervene, there was another little about 80 days left of the genocide where people could lives could have been spared, including my parents, frankly. And so we have reasons uh, to be angry at him. We have reasons to, and the uh, whole idea that he's a lib he liberated Rwanda, that he saved Rwandan people, it's not true because he killed, he allowed the killings to, to, to continue, not only for Tutsis, but also for the Hutus that he killed by his own hands. And it so- It seems to be like his regime is just built on lies. Like Absolutely. it's it's good. It has to collapse at some point. I haven't seen yet a regime built on lies that has lasted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've, I've I've failed to see one, whether it be also Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union. So many examples: Libya, Iraq. The time will come. The time will come. Absolutely, time will come. And the fact is, he the way he was able to 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 control this narrative all along is that he came out and he came in 1994 and appeared as though he was the hero. He appeared, he told the Rwandan people that I saved you and he's been putting that information through both doct indoctrination and, and, and forcing, I mean, in Rwanda, like I said, every um, newspaper, Rwandan newspaper is, go, doesn't, none of them criticize Kagame. I mean, you could Google Kagame in Rwandan newspaper, you will never ever see any single insult. So even Rwandan people who know their family members were killed by the RPF are never reading any of those crimes in their newspapers because the newspapers are controlled by Paul Kagame himself. So he's brainwashing people. And on top of that brainwashing, but anytime somebody brings up the genocide and brings up his crimes, he calls them genocide deniers and so on, or calls them out like he did to almost every France, Belgium, UK, US, every international forces saying um, that you, their, their lack of intervention is what led to the hundreds of hundreds and thousands of deaths in Rwanda. So he uses, he's been successfully able to, to maintain that, that narrative and that, um, that story, the guilt stripping that he does on, on the international community the, and on the Rwandan people by imposition of those that views and that only Tutsis were killed in the genocide and that nobody else can be talked about is it's repressive and it's what's allowed him to continue to stay, to stay um, in power power and like you said uh, truth always comes out first of all and there's no regime as as evil as this that can last with all the facts that we know i wanted 
to raise the issue since you mentioned economic sanctions as a potential penalty, which I think is a fair penalty. The issue of Chinese investment into Rwanda and how if economic sanctions by the West are to be implemented, they should be implemented now before Chinese investment supplement any potential losses to the Rwandan economy. Because if the effect of sanctions is not felt, I don't think there's an incentive for Kagame to do anything. I don't think the Rwandan people would speak up if they didn't see the consequences of the Kagame regime in front of them. And before China kind of makes Rwanda economically impervious to sanctions, we need to take action. Absolutely, and and frankly, like like I said, so economic sanctions is one is one way. Um, but also, I mean, Rwanda President Kagame is invited to forums and platforms and uh, quite often, and the knowledge of his crimes and his and his abuses are is in the public. So people who can cons consistently include him as an example should be aware that that person and should not be part of this dialogue, especially when you talk about peace and development and reconciliation, because he's the op complete opposite of it. So he's successfully fooled people into inviting him to these types of, 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 uh, of organizations, of events, of, of platforms and forums to uh, give him the place to flourish. And so I think that's another, that's another angle that can be taken but to bring go back on the economic aspect which i think is another uh, example of this the rwandan deception is that um in the world bank reports at least some a lot of uh, reports that came out a couple years ago i'd have to find the exact author but um they claim that rwanda also lied on the on their economic numbers so even the success story that we're hearing about the development in rwanda is all numbers that the rwandan government writes in in order to have more help and have more investment and, and so it's important to look deeper into it for policymakers making these decisions, for people th thinking of even going to invest in Rwanda. Are you safe to invest in Rwanda, given that the justice system doesn't allow you to have your international lawyers to defend you if something had happened? So let's call into question the legitimacy of, of a justice system that would protect you if you wanted to invest in, a, in that country. Um, if you and cannot so guarantee foreign investors their private property, they will never invest in your country. Exactly. Exactly. And so that's another that's another angle to, to be taken, not only from an economic standpoint, but telling people going to who are want to invest in Rwanda today to realize the risk that they're taking and that perhaps by not doing that, then they will be um, taking away from a repressive regime that has hurt and killed and uh, done so much wrong to his own people. I wanted to conclude on this, if it's okay with you. What happens post Kagame? If he, let's say he dies in power, let's say he resigns, whenever it is that Kagame is no longer there, mm -hmm. what happens? So I think he's, um, his current RPF party will had that has maintained power. I think I, my thoughts is that if they have not thought any, of any transition from Kagame, whether he lives or, or, or dies, um, is again very irresponsible for a political, um, uh, for anyone. It's a cult of personality. It's... Exactly. Um, so what happens after him? I don't know. I, all I know is that they have to start. They have to start opening up the space, the political space, for other people to be to be part of it, to share their voices, to share their concerns, without feeling like they, without dying, without being imprisoned, and without disappearing. Um, I don't know what comes next. I think that needs to be discussed. But it would start by opening up the platform for others, and so that people don't feel afraid for their lives, just for speaking. Okay, just to follow up on that, do you see Kagame opening up the political space or does he have to go? He has to go. He's a murderer. He's a murderer. He's a he's a person. He this man does not deserve to be in in in, uh, in power. He's a he's a really really bad person. And so um, I think Paul Kagame should must go. Um, but again, I'm. I'm a Belgian and American citizen living outside of the of Rwanda, and as much as unfortunately Rwanda, if I go to Rwanda today, they would lock me up and cut my hair off just for the things we said in this interview. Um, but um, but I wish that one day I get to go home to my my home country as well and be able to 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 see and be and understand it. And but however, in terms of 
politics and who can participate and when and how, I think that that question can be left to, to another person beside me. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's excellent. Uh, thank you very much. This has been Farid Ahmed interviewing Karine Kanimba on the issue of Rwanda and its future. Uh, thanks for watching.